First thing you're going to do, quickly review the parallelogram theorem. So the first one said, if a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then its opposite sides are congruent. So here you can see, if we know that quadrilateral ABCD is a parallelogram, then we know that the opposite sides must be congruent to each other. The second parallelogram theorem said, if a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then its opposite angles are congruent. So if we know that quadrilateral ABCD is a parallelogram, then we know the opposite angles must be congruent to each other. Angle A must be congruent to angle C, angle B must be congruent to angle D. The third parallelogram theorem said, if a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then its consecutive angles are supplementary. So remember, consecutive angles are just angles that share a side. So that would be angle A and angle D, angle A and angle B, angle B and angle C, angle C and angle D. Those pairs are consecutive angles. And in a parallelogram, their measures add up to 180 degrees. They are supplementary. The fourth parallelogram theorem said if a parallelogram has one right angle, then it has four right angles. And down here, if we know that quadrilateral ABCD is a parallelogram and one of the angles is a right angle, then all of them must be right angles. There were two diagonals of a parallelogram theorem. The first one said if a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then the diagonals bisect each other. This one's pretty straightforward. If we know that quadrilateral ABCD is a parallelogram, then these two diagonals, segment AC and segment BD, are going to cut each other in half. They bisect each other. The other diagonal of a parallelogram theorem says if a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then each diagonal separates the parallelogram into two congruent triangles. So here you can see if we know that quadrilateral ABCD is a parallelogram, then each of these diagonals are going to separate the parallelogram into two congruent triangles. So if we're just looking at the red diagonal, segment AC, then we know that this triangle, triangle ADC, has to be congruent to triangle CBA over here. If we're just looking at the green diagonal, we know that triangle ABD has to be congruent to triangle CDB. Gonna split! It's example time! Example one says find the coordinates of the intersection of the diagonals of parallelogram L, M, N, O with the vertices L, M, N, O. Okay, so in order to find the coordinates of the intersection of the diagonals, first thing we need to do, plot the points. So we're going to plot each of these points. L is at negative 1, 7. We go over negative 1 on the x-axis, up 7 on the y-axis, put a point. M is at 8, 7. We go over 8 on the x-axis, up 7 on the y-axis, put a point there. That is M. N is at 6, negative 2. We go over 6 on the x-axis, down negative 2 on the y-axis, put point N. And then O is at negative 3, negative 2. We go over negative 3 on the x-axis, down negative 2 on the y-axis, put point O. There is our parallelogram, L, M, N, O. Next, we are trying to figure out the coordinates of the intersection of the diagonals. Okay, so there are two diagonals here, and they're going to intersect at this point. So what is this point? How do we figure that out? Well, we know from the theorems we just talked about that the diagonals of a parallelogram bisect each other, meaning that this point right here is going to be in the middle or the midpoint of segment MO. It's also going to be in the middle or the midpoint of segment LN. So all we have to do then is figure figure out what is the midpoint of each of these segments. That is the intersection of our two given diagonals. So let's find the midpoint of each of our diagonals. First, we're going to find the midpoint of segment LN. So to find the midpoint, we need the midpoint formula. In the midpoint formula, we need one of these points to be x sub 1, y sub 1, and the other one to be x sub 2, y sub 2. We then plug in those coordinates to their corresponding spot in the midpoint formula. And we simplify. Negative 1 plus 6 is going to be 5. 7 plus negative 2 is the same thing as 7 minus 2, which is also 5. So you get 5 over 2, comma 5 over 2. Or we could write that as 2.5, comma 2.5, or 2.5, comma 2.5. Now let's see if we get the exact same coordinate with segment MO, our other diagonal. So to find the midpoint, we need one of these points to be x sub 1, y sub 1, and the other one to be x sub 2, y sub 2. We then plug in those coordinates to their corresponding spot in the midpoint formula. And we simplify. 8 plus negative 3 is the same thing as 8 minus 3. 7 plus negative 2 is the same thing as 7 minus 2. 8 minus 3 is 5. 7 minus 2 is 5. So we get 5 over 2, comma 5 over 2, or 2 and a half, comma 2 and a half. Meaning that the midpoint of each of of these diagonals is the exact same point, meaning that the diagonals bisect each other. They cut each other in half. So we know that this point right here is the intersection of the diagonals, 2.5 comma 2.5. Ooh, time for a U-turn!
Okay, doing the same thing here. So we again have a parallelogram. This time it's A, B, C, D with these given vertices. So we're going to plot each of these points. First, point A is that negative 4, 4. We go over negative 4 on the x-axis, up 4 on the y-axis, put a point. Point B is that negative 1, 4. We go over negative 1 on the x-axis, up 4 on the y-axis, put a point. C is that negative 2, negative 2. We go over negative 2 on the x-axis, down negative 2 on the y-axis, put a point. And then D is that negative 5, negative 2. We go over negative 5 on the x-axis, down negative 2 on the y-axis, put point D. There is our parallelogram, A, B, C, D. We are again finding the coordinates of the intersection of the diagonals. So these are our two diagonals here. And we know in a parallelogram that the diagonals bisect each other, meaning that this intersection is going to be the midpoint of both of these diagonals because it's going to cut both of those diagonals in half. So in order to find this intersection, all we have to do is find the midpoint of both of these diagonals to make sure it's the same point. So what is the midpoint of segment AC? Well, we choose one of these points to be x sub 1, y sub 1, and the other one to be x sub 2, y sub 2. We plug in these coordinates to their corresponding spot in the midpoint formula, and we simplify it. Negative 4 plus negative 2, you're going to get negative 6. And then 4 plus negative 2 is the same thing as 4 minus 2, which is 2. So negative 6 over 2 becomes negative 3. 2 over 2 becomes 1. Now let's make sure that segment BD also has that same midpoint. If it does, then we know that that is the intersection of the two diagonals. So we again choose one of the points to be x sub 1, y sub 1, the other one to be x sub 2, y sub 2 for our segment BD this time. We have our midpoint formula here. We plug in the coordinates to their corresponding spot in the midpoint formula. And now we can simplify. Negative 1 plus negative 5 is going to be negative 6. 4 plus negative 2 is the same thing as 4 minus 2. And then negative 6 over 2 becomes negative 3. 4 4 minus 2 becomes 2, and 2 over 2 is just 1. So both of the diagonals have a midpoint of negative 3, 1, meaning that this is a parallelogram, as we know, meaning that the diagonals bisect each other. So this point right here has to be the midpoint for both segments, and that point is negative 3, 1. Now let's quickly review how we do geometric proofs. So in this class, we first mark up the figure with the given information. So you're looking for something to say something is congruent to something else. One measure is equal to another measure. Next, we state the given. After that, we are going to use problem solving techniques to get from what we're given to what we're trying to prove. So that's when you mark up things that we could eventually prove in our two column proof. So let's go ahead and do a couple. Example two says we are given parallelogram JKPH and parallelogram LKPM. And we want to prove that segment HJ is congruent to segment ML. So the first step in a geometric proof is to mark up the figure with our given information. So we're given that these two are parallelograms. Now that doesn't say anything is congruent to anything else. So we can't mark anything up yet. The second step in a geometric proof is to state our given. So again, we are given parallelogram JKPH and parallelogram LKPM. The reason for that, it's given. After that, we move on to step three in a geometric proof. We need to come up with a game plan. How are we going to get from what we're given to what we're trying to prove? Well, we know that JKPH, this quadrilateral right here, is a parallelogram. And if it's a parallelogram, then we know opposite sides must be congruent to one another because opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent. We know that theorem now. We also know that quadrilateral LKPM is also a parallelogram, meaning it also has opposite sides congruent to each other. Now, based on what we marked up, we can see that if segment HJ right here is congruent to segment PK and segment ML is also congruent to segment PK or KP, then we know that they must be congruent to each other by the transitive property. Okay, cool. That's what we're going to do. So we know that these are parallelograms. That was our first step because it's given. Next, we can say that opposite sides of a parallelogram must be congruent. So segment HJ must be congruent to segment PK. And segment PK must be congruent to segment ML. And the reason for that, you just write out the theorem. And you can abbreviate some words if you'd like to. You're going to write opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent. Next, because we know segment HJ is congruent to segment PK and segment PK is congruent to segment ML, we know that segment HJ must be congruent to segment ML by the transitive property. If A is congruent to B and B is congruent to C, then A must be congruent to C. That's a transitive property of congruence. And you're done. So first step in a geometric proof, mark up the figure with the given information. What are we given? We're given that quadrilateral ABCD is a parallelogram. Now that doesn't say anything is congruent to anything else. So there's nothing to mark up yet. 
We move on to step two in our geometric proof, which is to state our given. So what are we given? We're given that quadrilateral ABCD is a parallelogram. And the reason for that, it's given. Step three in a geometric proof is to come up with a game plan. How are we going to get from what we're given to what we're trying to prove? So in our given figure over here, we are trying to show that triangle ADB, this triangle right here, is congruent to triangle CDB. So to prove two triangles congruent, we need some sides and maybe some angles. So let's mark up everything we know. Since we know this is a parallelogram, we know that opposite sides must be congruent because opposite sides of a parallelogram must be congruent. Also, because it's a parallelogram, we know opposite angles must be congruent. So angle A right here or angle DAB has to be congruent to angle C or angle BCD. And that's because opposite angles of a parallelogram are congruent. We also know that segment BD must be congruent to segment BD by the reflexive property because both triangles share that given side. So now, based on what we've marked up, there's actually a few different ways we could prove these two triangles congruent. One would be side angle side because we have two sides in one triangle congruent to two sides in the other and the included angle, the angle between those two sides, congruent to each other in each triangle. We could also prove these two triangles congruent by side, 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 because we have all three sides of one triangle congruent to all three sides of another. So either of those would work here. I'm gonna prove it congruent by side, side, side. So to do that, I need to say that since quadrilateral ABCD is a parallelogram, I know that opposite sides must be congruent. So segment AB must be congruent to segment CD, and segment AD must be congruent to segment CB because opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent. I then have two sides in one triangle congruent to two sides in another. I need the third side. So I'm going to say segment BD is congruent to segment BD. Anytime you say something is congruent to itself, that's the reflexive property. Now that I've shown all three sides in one triangle congruent to all three sides in the other, I can say that these two triangles then must be congruent by the side, side, side congruence postulate. Now, I could have also just used one theorem in here. It would have been two steps. Because you know ABCD, the quadrilateral, is a parallelogram, you know that this diagonal right here separates the parallelogram into two congruent triangles. So you could say that triangle ADB is congruent to triangle CDB in the second step. And the reason for that would be because ABCD is a parallelogram, each diagonal separates it into two congruent triangles. Either one of those work. Example three, we have another geometric proof. So here we are given that quadrilateral BDHA is a parallelogram, and we're given that segment CA over here is congruent to segment CG down here. We're going to prove that angle BDH, this little angle in here, is congruent to angle DGH, this little angle over here. Okay, first step in a geometric proof, mark up the figure with the given information. So what are we given? We're given that this is a parallelogram. There's nothing that says anything is congruent right there, so we can't mark anything up. But this right here says segment CA is congruent to segment CG. Now, instead of putting like tick marks like we normally do, because there's multiple different segments in our one big segment that is congruent to our one big segment, I'm just going to show it like this. I know that these two green segments are congruent to each other. Next, step two in a geometric proof, I'm going to state the given. So we are given that quadrilateral BDHA is a parallelogram and segment CA is congruent to segment CG. The reason for that, it's given. Step three in a geometric proof, we got to come up with a game plan. How are we going to show that this little angle right here is congruent to this little angle right here? Well, we know that BDHA is a parallelogram, meaning that opposite angles must be congruent to each other. So we can mark that up in our figure. We also know that because these two side lengths are congruent to each other, that makes this whole big triangle an isosceles triangle, meaning that the base angles must be congruent. So angle HAB has to be congruent to angle DGH over here because base angles of an isosceles triangle are are congruent. That's the isosceles triangle theorem. So now if I know that angle HAB or BAH has to be congruent to angle BDH or HDB because opposite angles of a parallelogram are congruent, and I know that angle HAB or BAH has to be congruent to angle DGH or HGD, then I know that these two angles must also be congruent by the transitive property. So if you didn't follow that, that's okay. We're going to walk you through it. So first, I'm going to say that angle HAB up here has to be congruent to angle BDH right here because opposite angles in a parallelogram are congruent. I then know because this side is congruent to this side that this is an isosceles triangle, meaning that the base angles, the angles that are opposite the congruent sides, 
have to be congruent to each other. And the reason for that is the isosceles triangle theorem, which says if it's an isosceles triangle, then the base angles must be congruent. Now, because angle HAB is congruent to angle BDH and angle HAB is congruent to angle DGH, then angle BDH must be congruent to angle DGH as well. And that is because of the transitive property. If A is congruent to B and B is congruent to C, then A must be congruent to C by the transitive property. Aren't you glad I didn't say you try? Okay, doing the same thing here. So first, we want to mark up the figure with the given information. Are we given anything is congruent to anything else? No, we're just given that both of these are parallelograms. So we move on to step two, which is to state our given. So we are given parallelogram ABCD and parallelogram GDEF. The reason for that, it's given. Step three, we want to come up with a game plan. How are we going to show that this angle, angle ABC right here, is congruent to this angle, angle GFE right here? Well, in a parallelogram, we know that opposite angles must be congruent to each other. We also know that these two angles right here form vertical angles, so they must be congruent to each other. And we know this is a parallelogram, so again, opposite angles must be congruent to each other. Oh, that's easy. So now we see that this angle right here has to be congruent to this angle down here. So first we said, because this is a parallelogram and this is a parallelogram, that opposite angles must be congruent. So the angles we want to talk about would be the red angles right here and right here. So we're going to say angle ABC has to be congruent to angle ADC and angle GFE has to be congruent to angle GDE. And that is because opposite angles in a parallelogram are congruent. Again, the blue angles, we don't need those in this figure. We're trying to prove that angle ABC is congruent to angle GFE, and those are the red angles. Next, we know that these two angles right here are formed by two intersecting lines, and they are non-adjacent angles, meaning that they are vertical angles. And by the vertical angles theorem, they must be congruent to each other. And since we know angle ABC is congruent to angle ADC, and angle ADC is congruent to angle GDE, then we know angle ABC must be congruent to angle GDE as well. And that's by the transitive property. So we've shown that this angle must be congruent to this angle. But we're trying to prove that this angle must be congruent to this angle. Well, we know now this angle is congruent to this angle, and this angle is congruent to this angle, so we can say that these two angles then must be congruent again by the transitive property. And you're done.